Hello and welcome to today's learning sessions, Impact in the Forest, Key Findings, um, organized by WWF Forest and Climate. Thanks for taking the time to join us. My name is Emmeline Gasparini and I am a program associate with the Forest and Climate team. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few logistics and some frequently asked questions. For those of you who have participated in past sessions, this will sound familiar, but yes, Today's presentation is being recorded, and you can find the recording within a few days on our YouTube channel. To get to the recording, simply go to youtube.com and search for WWF Forest and Climate. There are two audio options. You can listen through your computer or dial in through the phone number that was provided in your registration email. It's important to note that if you experience audio difficulties while listening through your computer, these are sometimes caused by having too many browser windows or programs open at once. So feel free to close some of them, which usually solves the issue, or you're always welcome to join by phone. If you continue to have technical difficulties, please send us a message via the chat area and we'll try to get you sorted out. Questions are absolutely welcome. You can send your questions anytime during the webinar using the toolbar on your screen. We will answer as many as possible during our allotted time. After the webinar, you'll receive a link in your follow-up email with additional forest and climate resources from WWF, including a link to the YouTube channel where you can watch a recording of the session. Thank you again for joining us, and with that, we'll get started. I believe Paul Chatterton is our first presenter, so Paul, take it away. Thanks very much, Emmeline, and hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Paul Chatterton. I'm the, the Landscape Finance Lead for WWF, uh, based in Vienna, Austria. And I'd like to introduce you to our other presenters. Uh, we have Peter Schkavel from the Impact Hub in Prague, who will take us through some, some of the slides. Uh, we have Tapas Mopane from Enevent, Based in based in Nepal, and Agnes Safford from Greenworks Asia, based in Jakarta. Um, not on the not on the, on this call are uh, three three co-authors: Tanya Haverman from Klar Mondial in Zurich, uh, which is a uh, financial um, advisory service. Uh, Peter Scheuch, the head of Enevent. Uh, that Enevent is a uh, uh, business innovation firm and Raphael Durr in um, in Malaysian Borneo, who was uh, a, a coordinator of this work. So let's let's dig into it. Um, the impact in the forest report came out of a set of discussions around the question of how business can achieve deforestation free and help build forest resilience and productivity. Um, thank you. Next, thanks for um, moving on the slide. Slide. Um, the I guess there's been a lot of discussion in the climate world about uh, how to engage business in in climate solutions. Uh, the same is true for sustainable development and uh, and certification. But all, but much of that discussion has been around large scale business. Uh, We've, we wanted to look at the question of how smaller scale and newer business can get engaged in, in deforestation free and uh, we particularly decided to focus on Asia as a starting point. Uh, we looked at a set of uh, case studies of innovation across Asia to, uh, to explore this question um, and talked to many different actors to understand their needs uh, to achieve scale, how, how could they what were they doing at the moment? Where was it successful? Where were the opportunities for growth? And what were the what were the blocks to uh, to achieving scale in in um, in more sustainable production? Um, five organisations worked on this report uh, from coming from very different perspectives: WWF on the environment, Event on business innovation, Impact Hub on the development of local entrepreneurial ecosystems. Uh, they're a, um, a space for green entrepreneurs with 80 offices around the world, and Clamondial and Greenworks Asia on the financing. Next slide, slide, please, Jenny. The big question that we were tackling is, um, is, is how extensive business innovations are for 
addressing deforestation. We found that uh, there isn't a lot going on, that uh, business incentives remain much stronger for promoting deforestation than for preventing it. There are a lot of isolated uh, examples of very good practice uh, in certification of, of forestry, uh, oil palm and other products, but the, the, the challenges are that uh, there's a whole set of incentives for deforestation that, is, that still exist across Asia. There are subsidies uh, that are promoting oil palm, there's uh, the public funding is not providing enough incentive to, uh, to move towards, towards certification, there's a lack of transparency and there's a vast number of illegal activities going on in most, most countries in Asia. The good news is that uh, there are quite a large number of, of green investments that are coming into force uh, with, with the climate conference in Paris last year and the uh, finalisation of the Sustainable Development Goals. There's a set of funding coming from, from uh, initiatives such as the Green Climate Fund and the Land Degradation Neutrality Fund and so forth that can help to finance business solutions for, for deforestation free. Um, so that's, that's an opportunity that will, that will appear more and more in Asia, uh, but the situation is still, still uh, uh, not very positive for, for deforestation-free uh, solutions. Next slide, Jenny. We focused on, on three landscapes in three countries. Uh, these are three, of the, uh, three countries that have some of the, the, the greatest biodiversity across Asia. They're the areas with, with highest, uh, some of the highest forest cover. Uh, and they're, the, they're areas where there's been significant investment in, in both climate and climate uh, emission reductions and, and uh, more sustainable forestry. So we looked at uh, the heart, heart of Borneo, the East Kalimantan in Indonesia, the Terai Ark region of Nepal, and the, the southern, southern provinces of Vietnam. Uh, and, and investigated for, for case studies of good business, business solutions that, that promoted protection of forest and sustainable use and, uh, and also looked at the trends that were going on there. So let me hand, hand over to Tapas from Innovent who will, will take, you, take you through some of the findings and, and case studies that we, um, we came up with. Tapas. Hello everyone, uh, this is Tapas. Uh, I'm based out of Kathmandu, Nepal. Uh, I'm the country manager for Enervent. So basically, uh, while we were looking at these uh, uh, forest enterprises, you know, in our research, what we found out was, uh, you know, uh, sustainable forest management you know, must make business sense. That is, uh, you know, there should be strong incentives for, you know, uh, preventing deforestation, as well as, you know, it has to make ecological sense as well. Now. Uh, in our research, uh, we also found out that uh, there's a strong foundation of uh, forest-related enterprises uh, in these countries. For example, in Nepal itself, uh, I believe there's like more than, um, I think, 40,000 or 3,000 different micro-enterprises, out of which I think two-thirds of them are based, uh, you know, forest-based enterprises, you know, based off NDFEs or, you know, other, other things. But like I said, most of them are small. So, I mean, you know, opportunities do exist for uh, kind of scaling uh, these small businesses to deforestation free, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, scaling them up. But uh, there are not enough incentives uh, to accelerate them. Uh, challenges in scaling, for example, uh, you know, uh, uh, there are challenges in access to finance. You know, there's not enough, uh, not, not adequate business management and entrepreneur skills. Uh, with these small uh, entrepreneurs or enterprises, you know the, the subsidies and regulations are perverse, or you know there's simply uh, you know the challenge of access to markets. Next slide, please. So uh, we looked at uh, some of these business opportunities in these three landscapes and kind of identified, uh, you know, the sectors with greatest potential. Uh, as you can see, there were rubber, cocoa, rotten. You know, essential oils, medicinal plants, 
and uh, low carbon technology as well, uh, in the cook stoves, biogas, and other renewables. Um, I mean, there's, you can see the table itself there. Um, you can also see, for example, you know, ecotourism you know, in these three countries uh, also came up as a potential forest-based uh, enterprise uh, that can, uh, you know, uh, reduce uh, deforestation. Next slide, please. And uh, these uh, these are just examples. Uh, if you see the pictures, uh, they are just examples of uh, you know, different uh, enterprises. For example, in Viet uh, in Vietnam, you can see uh, you know how uh, you know the use of biogas has been uh, using present on the forest, uh, and at the same time, I think I believe uh, you know the the, the slurry is also. It can also be used as an organized uh, organic fertilizer. So I mean, these are all good examples. Uh, you can see it for yourself of how uh, you know some of these uh, some of these enterprises are functioning in these countries. Uh, now I, I I would like to uh, request Agnes to take this presentation forward. She'll be talking, I think, a bit about you know the need for scaling and the pathways for scaling in Okay. So in that last slide, we saw some very good examples of what we believe could be deforestation-free projects or products. So the big question or the big challenge becomes, how do you actually achieve economic scale? Next slide. I live in Indonesia, and daily I see the impact of palm oil and the fact that deforestation free products cannot compete with palm oil and the only way we'll be able to put a um, not a full stop but to put some sort of brakes on the station here in Indonesia is to actually be able to scale up some of the products that we're talking about rattan, rubber, uh, bio energy, various things like that. Um, so when I'm talking about scale, just so we're really clear about what scale is, when you're talking about scaling something, you're talking about having a sustainable business model that can grow in size and be replicated and basically reach an economies of scale. And that's really important. And I'll talk about why it's really important. But before we go to that, I, I want to talk a little bit about some of the pathways for scaling, some of the, the ways to actually get there. Um, so the first one that's fairly obvious is geography. And a good example of that is somewhere like um, central Kalimantan or the whole island of Kalimantan, Borneo. Uh, has big rubber plantations and lots of smallholder plantations and smallholder um, hectareage. So that's a geographical area that could be improved and you could get better scale by working with the various smallholders. One of the most interesting things about scale, I think, and I'm going to just focus on it specifically, is technology. Scale, using technology to scale, so the technology innovations that are available. And of course, we all think of them in terms of, well, we have satellite tracking and we have um, GIS mapping, all sorts of things that will help us. But then if you're talking in the business, how does it really help us? So technology can help particularly in agricultural commodities, it can help us acquire new buyers for the commodities. It can help reduce the costs for the smallholders. It can help us disperse market knowledge. It can help us disperse pricing knowledge. And it also helps in risk management. So technology is one of the things that's very exciting and very applicable to scaling. The rest, I think, are fairly obvious how you'd use those in scaling. So as I said, the question is, 
why is scale important? Well, the bottom line is if you can't get scale or a critical mass, you can't really have significant impact and you cannot attract the finance that you need to get these projects to the next stage. Next slide. Okay, so this, this slide, the top half of it is quite interesting and this is where on this project, Impact in the Forest, we said, okay, let's look at some of the um, products that we know we can scale. And basically what this is showing is, for instance, with Rattan, Rattan is doing very well in Vietnam. And so we have the blue dot there. Vietnam is the point where it's starting from. And then we can spread it out from Vietnam to Indonesia to Nepal because those are the three countries we're focusing on. In the case of medicinal plants, Nepal is way ahead of the other two. So it would start from Nepal to Indonesia and to Vietnam. And in terms of cocoa, you can go from Indonesia back to the other two. So, so that's a great example of using geographical scaling and using the knowledge that's in those particular strong countries. And the bottom half of the page, I don't think will take very much explanation, is basically the model that IIF sees as how we can really have an impact and achieve scale. And now I'm going to pass over to Petra. That's correct. Hi, everybody. This is Petra from Impact Hub. Um, and if I can ask for the next slide. Very well. So when it comes to supporting innovation and enterprises uh, from the early stage all the way up to reaching significant scale, in our experience, it really takes a village. It takes a variety of actors. So, so we looked at four different types of actors in our research when we were looking at the state of the entrepreneurial ecosystem in each, in each country, in each landscape. Um, it, it starts with the business innovators um, as the core audience. And by that we mean both local entrepreneurs, enterprises, uh, such as the, the one that uh, Tapas mentioned it in his examples, um, as well as uh, larger, perhaps global actors. Uh, you know, for example, one of, the things we, one of the examples we mentioned in the report, is a sustainable return production partnership between WWF and IKEA and Lao. Um, then we, we also looked at the, the incubators, uh, programs that provide support to both new and existing businesses in developing and market testing their, their innovations. And uh, we found most of them, um, you know, we, we found that they do exist in, in the landscapes or the countries we, we focused on. Um, but mostly they're focused on cities, very often they're tech focused, um, and so very few focus on the environment and even less so uh, on the target landscapes. We also looked at connectors, um, meaning individuals and organizations and networks that support startups and, and innovations throughout their journey towards running operations and scaling by building partnerships and building important connections uh, throughout, throughout that process. And again, we, we found a variety of uh, both international and local actors such as SNV and GIZ or Vietnam Clean Production Center or Entrepreneurs of Nepal. Uh, but again, they're mostly, mostly active in cities and, and not on, in the target landscape. So there's definitely a lot of work that needs to be still done. Uh, and finally, we looked at the investors that uh, obviously provide uh, startup or growth capital. And uh, we um, have found uh, uh, again, multitude of different, you know, both from, from the private sector, such as Lotus Impact in Vietnam, or multilateral, multilateral institutions, such as the Asia Development Bank, NGOs, and even commercial banks being active in the sector. Um, and although only a few focus on deforestation, there's at least one in each country that, that um, uh, does invest in environmental causes and um, we generally expect that the amount of environmental investment available in the region will grow. Um, 
uh, although there will be another challenge that a lot of the investors uh, have faced and will face is that relatively few of the enterprises actually reach uh, the level of development where they're able to absorb investment. So there are relatively few investment opportunities available. So the hypothesis we wanted to test in the research and we want to work with going forward as well is if we combine all four actors or types of actors in a coordinated ecosystem of support, it's then the, it's likely that more ventures will progress towards investability and scale and it's more likely that the initiative will produce more long-term results and growth um, and um, impact on deforestation. If I can ask for the next slide, please. So we started developing a model of how the different forms of support of innovations and ventures addressing deforestation can be coordinated throughout their journey and across landscapes. But the first steps include market education and incubation of new um, or, or in identification of existing projects within a landscape um, and early stage capacity building. As a part of this initial work, it is also important to create a community of actors prepared to collaborate and support such activities over time. In the next phase, appropriate partners need to be brought in to support projects becoming economically viable and scalable. And um, again, as, as, as um, Agan has already described, we have identified several different scaling routes uh, that are further described in the report. It's, uh, of course, also important to measure the impacts and to learn from what works and what doesn't work as the projects, projects, progress, progress, progress. And we also believe that it's critical to share the success stories to attract more entrepreneurial talent and businesses and resources to addressing deforestation. And finally, we also see a need for a certain level of coordination across the landscape and also internationally to ensure that the successful solutions are registered, replicated, and that large-scale large -scale investors are attracted. There is also a need to promote certification like FSC that uh, helps small businesses to build credibility and uh, also work with certification authorities to include uh, protection of habitat and species. I can ask for the next slide, please. Finally, we look at we look at what are the interventions needed to achieve the objective of supporting entrepreneurial innovation uh, with measurable impact uh, to uh, you know throughout the process from early stage to, to scale. And uh, we basically identified four key interventions. One is building community platform to really activate the local communities and local businesses in addressing reforestation and, and, and uh, engage them in the theme, uh, as well provide uh, physical infrastructure and start structuring some key partnerships. We need to work with, secondly, we need to work with the key actors in, in the incubation and acceleration that support the innovation system um, to, to source um, support and launch innovations. Uh, we, we also need to uh, attract and engage a variety of investors in the process and deploy novel financing mechanisms such as performance-based financing models. And uh, it's important, important to attract funding not only for the ventures themselves but for some of the ecosystem actors such as inc incubators and connectors to, to have incentives to actually support uh, businesses and ventures in the target landscapes. And as already mentioned, um, certification is, is important and also needs to evolve um, over time. And with that, I'll hand it over back to Paul. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. So in wrapping up, um, it's clear that there's an appetite for significant investment, both from the private sector and the public sector. And But there's some significant blocks to allowing that investment to move forward and, and, and help um, develop scale among, among businesses in contributing to deforestation free solutions. Next slide, Jenny. So we, um, so what, what, what can be done to, to, uh, to take this forward? How can you engage? If you go back one slide, Jenny, that's, 
how can you engage in the private in the public sector, um, the money is flowing. There is investment going into green businesses. There are some small uh, exercises in supporting entrepreneurial support systems and innovation processes. I think that can certainly grow. Uh, building building this ecosystem is fundamental, as well as building the individual businesses. Well, what we found is that there's a real um, lack of understanding from the private from the public sector about how the private sector operates. This was this was a real learning between us within the team. We come from a mix of public and private sector and we found ourselves talking at cross purposes to each other. The languages are so different, the way of organising is so different. Um, we, we had to spend a lot of time educating each other on how, on how our our worlds operate. Um, and I think that's, a, that's an issue for the, uh, more generally uh, to find a way of, of ta for the public sector to take a more proactive attitude towards the, the private sector and understand what are its limits, what are its needs and how it operates. From the private sector point of view, there's, there's an enormous amount of funds now, now becoming available for green business. This is really struggling to find investable opportunities in, at scale. One of the issues that, um, that, that we've heard is, is that um, the private sector investors are asking what is green? You know, they, there's so many different standards. Uh, in the forestry sector there's, there's, there's FSC, PFC and many, many national systems. Which one do you go for? So achieving some sort of clarity on standards, some simplification of, of certification system and monitoring Monitoring is uh, is really important. Um, also, systems to aggregate between different uh, different projects across a, a geography or or through a trade chain is is very important. If you can bring the public and private sector together, then then you know, we we think there is possibility to greatly accelerate uh, work on deforestation free. But it means that we, we all have to understand this, um, how to achieve this more comprehensive ecosystem approach, an end-to-end -end approach that covers the entire innovation funnel, that tests effective models and, and, and invests in the ones that prove themselves to be successful, and that advances impact metrics because until we know what is successful, uh, we're not going to be any further ahead. Uh, next slide, Jim. So what next, uh, as a team, we'll be moving forward uh, on all of these things, uh, but we'd very much invite, invite you to, to join with us in, in this work and, and uh, contact us and uh, encourage you to, to test out some of these questions. Uh, piloting so solutions, so, so finding small uh, business opportunities that can support forest protection and sustainable management and uh, connecting smaller organisations to bigger companies that are prepared to invest in, in sustainable products, purchase sustainable products, um, helping to build businesses and so forth. This is something that, that uh, uh, is a key, key focus for our work. In Nepal, for instance, uh, the, you know, N event is working with 15,000 15, farmers uh, uh, organised by the, the uh, Mountain Institute farmers that are producing medicinal and aromatic plants, can they be brought together to produce, um, to supply the global supply chains and to better protect the, uh, the rhododendron forests that surround, surround the, those areas. Uh, building a support system for ecosystem for green business, we've talked about how it's the combination of these different pieces that really starts to drive business innovation. Each one of them is useful, but if we can if we can bring these pieces together, then then um, then the acceleration begins. You can turbocharge the the process. That's a that's a challenging thing to do, and and it requires um, you know concerted effort. It requires an understanding of these different pieces and communication between the different the different parts. So. Um, Taking a learning approach um, between us all, learning learning how these these different pieces work, and and how they can coordinate uh, with each other is really important, uh, and that's something we want to continue to uh, to work on. Um, 
and through that to be able to uh, to build innovation funnels, support individual projects, and and uh, and develop the monitoring. And then there's the financing, which which should be driving this, um, but obviously is not because it's um, it's not able to find the projects. Uh, so working with financiers, uh, coming up with more innovative financing strategies. Um, helping with the with the readiness process uh, d that, that develops projects for financing and brings projects to scale, links them with other projects so that they uh, they are actually digestible by investors who want to put in you know, more significant amounts of money um, and connecting connecting investors and the and the standards by which by which they work. So there's three three um, next steps for for us as a team, and uh, you know three sets of recommendations, I guess, for all of you engaged in looking at this question. Um, and I think that's a uh, that's a, um, a summary of where we're recommending that we'll go on on developing business um, deforestation free business solutions. We've we've taken this. Deep dive into a, into three landscapes in in Asia, um, and now we want to test whether some of these hypotheses can can work in those landscapes and more generally across Asia. Um, it would be very interesting to look at whether whether the same dynamics are true in in other forest continents, forested continents, um, and uh, and and more generally how how this might uh, might might uh, support the efforts that are coming down from climate and sustainable development policies. So let me set, stop there and um, thank you for your attention and thank you, thank all the presenters for their hard work and uh, and, and words and um, hand back to Emmeline. Right, thanks Paul and thank you again yes to all of the presenters. It's really um, a fascinating subject and something that's uh, definitely a big issue on the horizon in terms of, um, you know, the forest community. Um, so I've got a couple of questions, but just to remind our participants that you can send questions to us through the question function in the toolbar, um, and I will ask them directly of the presenters. And then if we run out of time at the end of our um, session today, I will chase after the presenters to um, follow up on any questions we didn't get to um, during our time today. So don't worry about that. I'm very good at uh, pestering people via email. So the first question um, I want to ask all of you is, what do you think are the main challenges for these deforestation-free enterprises to reach the level where they can absorb commercial investment? Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question again? I, yeah, of course. I uh, what do you think are the main challenges for these deforestation-free enterprises to reach the level where they can absorb commercial investment? So uh, uh, I can give a, a part of an answer. I'm sure uh, some of the others on the team will be able to add more. Um, I think one of the key issues is access to market because uh, a lot of the forest enterprises are in isolated areas and don't necessarily have access to uh, the larger markets and uh, buyers um, to, you know, generate additional revenue and and, and uh, grow their business. I'd say it's the disconnect between even the um, the markets and the growers, the producers. So, in other words, in many remote areas, you have small groups of farmers or small businesses that are producing something and they really are totally disconnected from what the market requires, what the product needs to, you know, to what standards. There's just, there's not that market knowledge with the producers and they, ha they really have no idea how to connect to the markets. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges. There's Paul here. There's, um, there's there's a set of subsidies and government regulations that continue to promote unsustainable production. That's certainly been the case in in oil palm. It's um, mm -hmm. although in Indonesia, in in Indochina, T 
timber, illegal timber continues despite government official efforts to prevent it? Um, and can that be changed around and can the, can the regulations, subsidies and enforcement be, uh, be shifted towards, towards sustainable production? Thank you. Sort of along those lines of um, government action, uh, I'm thinking of the annual smog event, in quotes, that happens um, in Indonesia and the surrounding countries. Yes, event is a very cute way to refer to it. Um, but since the, the forest fires are centered in Indonesia, uh, what do you think the Indonesian government is um, doing? Are they making any steps to promoting these sort of deforestation-free small business enterprises, um, particularly in relation to combating um, the illegal fires that are producing this smoke and smog? Agnes, I'm not sure well, if you want to jump in. Yeah, thanks. I'll jump in. One of the biggest issues that the government is tackling is the peatlands. Many of the fires start in areas adjacent to peatlands by combination of smallholders, small businesses, various people clearing, using fire as a way to clear, and then the fire gets into the peatlands. Once the peatlands start burning, you pretty much need heavy rain to put out those fires. So the one positive thing that they are, or one of the positive things that the government is doing is really getting on to how to manage peatlands and how to stop the fires from getting to the peatlands. That's probably the most proactive part of what they're doing. But I'd also like to add that I don't think it's just Indonesia. I think Singapore and Malaysia are going to need to start cooperating and Indonesia cooperating with those countries to really figure out a whole system to help these deforestation free products get off the ground and change the way things are done. Just to add to that, Agnes, the um we were lucky enough to have the head of the Indonesian Peatland Restoration Agency, Nazir Fouad, uh, write, write the foreword, foreword for this report. Um, and he, he pinpoints on the need for, for work with smallholders. The, some of the larger companies are now starting to clean up their act, um, commit to sustainable practices, join certification systems, uh, and, and you know, are becoming part of the solution rather than the problem, not all of them, um, but there's a shift going on there. It's much harder for smallholders uh, to, to move towards sustainability and, uh, and you know, that's, that's why it's very important to be looking at business support for, for small producers of products such as, um, such as oil palm and rubber and, and so forth, helping, helping them to, um, to get access to market, get better prices. Uh, uh, access to, to premiums that come with, with certification uh, in some cases and to, um, to support them to, to protect their surrounding land so that their forests aren't lost and, and go up in fire when, uh, when they're producing their products. I'll give a good example of a company that's actually working with smallholders. Uh, Riau Province, which happens to be fairly close to Singapore, is one of the biggest palm oil producing areas in Sumatra. And we're starting to see companies that are working with some of the smallholders to actually produce alternative crops. And there was one example cited in the newspaper just a couple weeks ago of palm oil farmers deciding not to clear and increase their palm oil hectareage but to grow spinach and send it to the markets where they wanted English spinach. And it's actually proved to be far more um, profitable than growing palm oil. Case in point. 
that actually follows, um, segues nicely into this question. Um, uh, our participant is asking, my understanding is that the rate of return on investment in the forest sector is substantially lower than palm oil. Is this the case in your experience with these deforestation-free enterprises? Do you have suggestions on how we can make these enterprises financially comparable to investment in palm oil? Well, I'll tackle that one because it's a it's a it's very difficult to compete with palm oil. The margins in the palm oil business are very high and the economics are phenomenal. And that is one of the reasons we've seen such growth in the palm oil industry in the last um, yeah, the last eight to ten years is you have companies going into palm oil that would have never dreamed of being in palm oil in the past. But if we go back a, uh, about 18 months ago, we had phenomenally high prices for palm oil. And fortunately, I say fortunately because in terms of trying to slow down deforestation, with the drop in the palm oil prices, you're seeing less expansion. But I'll be honest, the economics are really hard to beat in palm oil. So it has to be done on a, a fairly, um, I mean, you have to look at the alternatives very clearly and carefully to even understand what you could be producing that can compete. And, it's, and many of these products, you've got to get them to very large scale to be able to compete. But then again, it gets back to what Paul said, we need to shift the subsidies and subsidize things that do not encourage deforestation. One of the opportunities there, Agnes, is, is the carbon financing that's starting to, that, that's starting to be uh, to flow or will will flow shortly um, in each of the landscapes we we're focusing on there are jurisdictional red programs these mm -hmm. these will if if the forest can be protected then and, and uh, yeah. the emission emissions produced from from forest loss and forest burning can be prevented then carbon payments can be made into those areas um, now the challenge has been how are those payments made in in most traditional uh, thinking about carbon carbon investments that the money is paid directly to the to the producer of the emission reduction so if a logging company decides not to log they get paid the question is, can those funds be used to, to stimulate further business development in a positive sense? Uh, uh, can, they, can, can this money be used to invest in, in more sustainable uh, forestry activities uh, such as rattan that keep the forest, forest going um, rather than just produce a, 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 a payment? Can they be, be, instead of carbon grants, can they become carbon investments to, to generate further business and, then, and that's very much at the core of the um, uh, a core question that started this whole discussion for us. Thanks Paul. Sort of along those lines, um, one of our participants asks if there has been any consideration of valuing forests as an asset class or the creation of forest or land banks against which financing products can be collateralized. I guess that's the whole idea of red, isn't it? Isn't it, Emily? And it's to um, produce a to add a value to forest for for the carbon that it retains, um, and um, and so increase the likelihood that that forest will be, will will be left standing rather than rather than lost. Thank you. That was the answer I was hoping you would give. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so I think we've got a little more time if participants have more questions they want to send us. Um, uh, this one is sort of taking a different tack. Uh, when we make efforts to increase market access for green growth, do we not risk the increase of access for deforestation intensive businesses as well, specifically when business incentives are still much stronger for deforestation? So are we, risk, are, are we risking too much? 
creating these openings, I think, is the essence of that question. Pepe, do you want to answer that? Uh, that uh, Nepal is a very good, ex good example of that question. <coughs> yeah, okay. <coughs> um, I don't think so, because uh, uh, basically each, each market, uh, each subsector, if you will, functions itself. Uh, and obviously, you know, uh, with each subsector, there are different policies and regulations within the country as well as, well as across, across the boundaries, uh, you know. Um, so no, I, I don't think it, it, it actually opens up uh, you know, space for uh, you know, uh, you know deforest. I mean, uh, forest-based uh, kind of enterprises. If you do open up uh, access to markets for, for example, maps in Nepal, uh, I don't think uh, there would be anyone, uh, any other bids coming in. Um, I would I would add one one uh, no, another answer to this, and, uh, which is that uh, when we recommend to support um, enterprises that address deforestation, it is not only in directly you know supporting enterprises who are based in the um, in in the forest deforestation fronts, but also working with enterprises who are in uh, or based in cities or who have you know have the access to markets who um, actually facilitate that connection between between the smallholders and and the larger markets and and, and either partnering with them or, or 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 accelerating some of the existing ones that focus on uh, deforestation free products and who can play that facilitation role um, that is you know that that limits deforestation rather than promotes it thank you um Along those lines, if private sector companies are interested in staying informed and engaged with these issues, how would you recommend they do so? Uh, perhaps I can suggest to to stay in, or reach out to each of the organisations that have that have been involved in this report. We're all uh, continuing to work on the, on these questions, and we'd be very happy to 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 talk to you. Um, I, I think also, you know. Uh, Test out some of the ideas if you're working in the forest sector um, and you you see the opportunity to uh, to explore some of the suggestions that we've put in the report, then we'd um, we'd very much encourage that and be happy to, um, to 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 talk to you further about how that how that might proceed. All right, thank you. Um, we just have one more question, unless participants. Um, have any other burning questions they would like our very informed panelists to answer. Um, but what do you think is the most effective way to support um, communities directly affected by deforestation and thinking specifically through um, the consumption aspect? So is it more effective to support a service or a product or a business from communities that are directly affected by deforestation? Um, or is there another way that you would recommend to ensure that so do, as individuals or do businesses... Do you understand the question? Sorry? Okay, so, so this, is, this is from the perspective of a consumer, of, of a I believe product so, that comes yes. from forests. Okay. Um, I think you know, both... You know, Purchasing products that come that are deforestation free and come from you know, directly from uh, from those communities uh, is, is definitely good practice. Although I think that it's it's a bit challenging to do that on a large scale. Um, and second is I think as consumers we need to demand from the the larger corporates that they actually um, make their supply chains and their products more sustainable. So if you look at a lot of the the products we looked at in our research, um, they're not necessarily the, the end product that, that gets to the consumer. They're usually, they usually feed into larger supply chains, and we need to make sure that, that if we buy um, products that they don't uh, contain products that actually cause deforestation. I think, I think the, the, the creating that pressure from the consumers will be one of the key drivers for market to shift. 
Yes, I'd reinforce that by saying that the biggest pressure on the palm oil producers, and you can look at, say, the top 10 producers in Indonesia, if it wasn't for consumer pressure on their buyers, i.e., pressure on you know the the likes of Procter and Gamble or Unilever, the the companies actually producing those final products. If consumers weren't putting pressure on those companies, we wouldn't be seeing the change we're seeing. It's direct from consumers. And buy only from ICL accredited um, certification schemes. So ICL is the is the certifier of certifiers, and WWF supports them very strongly. They they um, they set a fairly high bar, and uh, you know their their members include FSC, Fair Trade, MSC, Rainforest Alliance, uh, and a whole range of others. If you're buying from them, you can trust that um, there are good standards and that, that the forests are being are being protected. Some of the other standards are less um, are less credible. Thank you. Um, I did have one more question um, submitted that I think is important for us to touch on. Uh, has there been trust building work with small scale farmers to switch to sustainable agriculture or more sustainable practices? What role does trust play and are there good case examples from other sectors? Who wants to have a go at that one? <laughs> <laughs> That's a complex one, isn't it? It is. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I, I don't I don't have an I don't have a direct answer on on the first part of the question. So maybe maybe someone else does. But this is one of the key reasons why we actually recommended that when you look at some of the early stage work that needs to happen, it, it actually includes community building because um, and, you know and trust is the sort of key is the core currency of of, of, of communities, um, because uh, without that, it, it's very hard to progress, and it's obviously something that isn't easy to, to build and conceptualize. It is, it is definitely, you know, it is something that needs to be done directly with the people on the ground, um, directly in the, in, you know, with the, uh, with the communities. Um, but um, you know, the, the, that's why we. When you look at the concept that we proposed, it doesn't only include a very you know hard skills building and, and connecting to markets and connecting to, to investors and building new in financial uh, tools, etc. But it actually does include also community building um, on the ground with a variety of actors um, that, that need to come uh, you know and to, to come together to actually support an innovative project in getting off the ground and, and eventually reaching scale. Thank you. Um, I would also note that uh, the Forest and Climate team has uh, several resources that we've published, not specifically building trust with small-scale farmers, but building trust um, and working with local communities and indigenous peoples. Uh, and that's um, possibly another area for you to investigate if you're looking for sort of case studies on why trust is important in this kind of work and um, how you can work to build trust and sort of what are the mechanisms to do so. Um, and we're pretty honest in our inspiring practices are things that work and things that didn't work. So you're welcome to uh, dig into those um, anytime they're on our website under the publications tab. Um, but it looks like we've answered all of our questions. So I think um, unless any of our panelists have closing statements, um, I'll finish it up. Panelists, this is your, your last moment. I need to, to thank you very much for your hosting, Emmeline, <laughs> and uh, for everyone's attention. Thank you. All right. So, Jenny, if you would change the slide, please. Um, I want to thank our presenters for sharing their expertise with our community and to thank the participants for joining us and sending in your very thoughtful and engaging questions. You'll all receive a follow-up email in a few hours with some additional resources that are specific to this webinar. If you want to revisit this webinar, uh, next slide please, um, or share it with colleagues, the recording will be up on the Forest and Climate YouTube channel in about a day or so. Um, and you can also find recordings of previous sessions there for additional enrichment. 
Um, and in the video description, I always put a link to a PDF of the presentation and uh, contact information for any presenters if you have specific questions um, that you think of later that you'd like to follow up on. Next slide, please. So thank you all again for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day.